All right. Um, we'll get going. Um, John Connor, CEO of the Climate Institute. Uh, we've got a great uh, panel here at this session. I was very keen um, uh, to have this as part of the program because um, really advocacy has been a driving force uh, behind uh, a lot of the initiatives and uh, that, that's been driving uh, some of the action. Um, and we have here um, some of the people who have been at the front line of accountability, if, um, if, uh, if nothing else, here. So uh, I have outlined um, elements of our approach at, at TCI in my opening comments, but I guess it's just important to uh, repeat from um, the perspective of following the money, um, we've always been trying to draw that uh, uh, alignment between the long-term responsibility uh, and the actual actions that are there, in particular for super funds, been highlighting the financial risks uh, uh, that are there now to make that more current. Uh, but in our broader work, we've also been trying to build some bridges. Uh, and um, uh, Emma, I think, mentioned it in the Australian Climate Roundtable, um, uh, the exercise there is actually, I think it's very important that we have that, we have this front line and fighting and accountability, but we've also got to take it somewhere. And so that's um, some broader work uh, that we've been doing as the Climate Institute. And obviously that's challenging when we go into an election phase and it's a, a bizarre election phase, probably one of the oddest ones in tw over 20 years, really, frankly, from my personal experience, where, where more is to be gained in the aftermath than in the pre-math, arguably. But um, perhaps we can uh, unpack that a little bit more in discussions. But why don't I um, uh, run the suite here and um, uh, hear from um, our panellists what they're doing, where they think things um, uh, could go in particular in relation to investors. So I might just pass you next, Blair. Sure. Thank you, John. Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, it's always heartening to have a group of people together, not only kind of already have their heads around this as an issue, but um, all of them taking action in some way, in their own way, um, to drive change and see movement in the space, whether it's motivated by profit or whether it's motivated by a combination of profit plus ethical investing or um, you know, there's such a range of things that make this a, a really interesting issue. Um, when we started the divestment campaign globally and then here in Australia back in 2013, uh, it was driven by those three numbers that Bill McKibben outlined in his Rolling Stone article, the, the Do the Math speaking tour, which looked at trying to keep the world at two degrees at that time. Now, of course, we were lucky enough to have Paris uh, discussions pointing to 1.5, but our chance of getting there is getting window is shrinking. Um, the scientists, uh, by and large, believe 565 gigatons is about the carbon budget we've got left to burn uh, before we cook the planet well past two degrees. Unfortunately, investment at that time was 200 and, uh, sorry, 2,795 gigatons or five times that carbon budget. So the idea of that whole article and the speaking tour was to get people to understand that the wake-up call was, we just can't do this. We can't build those mines. We can't continue with the gas production. We can't continue with oil drilling. So when you connect those numbers with then the question of what do you do, divestment became for us an answer and a way that people, uh, individuals and institutions could drive change more quickly. And that was the driver for taking up divestment as a campaign. Um, it's fantastic to have Stephen here. They were, Rockefeller is one of the leading uh, organizations not only in divesting themselves, but telling how they did it, why they did it, and what the challenges were, so being instructional for other institutional investors. The churches have been a leader globally. Uh, here in Australia, they were one of the first outfit to divest was the uh, Uniting Church. Uh, so fantastic leadership uh, there in terms of saying, hey, we're just going to do it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, Stanford University, another um, early uh, divesting uh, university and and unlike Harvard and Yale in the US just again just said it's the right thing to do we're going to get on with it because we're a university about the future not a university about the past but tipping the scales was the Norwegian sovereign fund the sheer scale and size of that divestment from money entirely out of fossil fuels uh, was a game changer and started to get people thinking beyond symbolic to real money so uh, the figure to date is 500 plus institutions. I would guess we're well up to 575 by now globally uh, since, since the end of the year uh, and $3.4 trillion divested globally. Um, again, I think Trevor mentioned next door uh, the importance of being clear that it's not 
all of those 500 have not completely divested. They've done things in a range of ways, but each one is a stepping process to moving away from fossil fuels and toward other alternatives. Here in Australia, the councils have been a key driver. So more than 15 councils, a couple waiting in the wings, just about to step up, which we'll, you'll hear about. Randwick just a week ago uh, uh, divested. Mostly these are councils who are choosing to uh, move away from the big four banks. So it's interesting because next door, Trevor was saying, often the banks are left in the comfort, comfort zone. Uh, but for councils, more often than not, their holdings are with banks and bank investment funds. So their change means moving out of the big four banks, which is often quite difficult to do in terms of services and other things. Uh, three universities, uh, one I can't name yet, but it's happening any minute. Uh, and it's good news. It's, a, it's a, a new sort of round of universities coming along. Student activism is beginning to step up. We'll see some things happening in the next month. Funds, uh, churches... Uh, it's an inspiration to watch, and from a campaigning point of view, just to wrap up, it's the momentum that counts. It started with one or two, now we're up to dozens, and more coming every month, every year. Um, people can see the action happening, they can be part of taking part in that. It's something they can contribute to climate change, often a difficult issue to feel like you're having any input on at all. So I just wrap up to say that's why we started it, that's how we've done it. Um, Australia is number two only to the U.S. in terms of the sheer numbers of, of switches and volume of that. Um, and in fact, I've just had someone uh, who was here earlier say that in the U.S. they don't even really quite in the general sense get the divestment campaign in the very mainstream as we have done here. So in some ways, the size of our markets allowed divestment to be actually bigger in Australia than the U.S. So thanks for that. Love to have questions. And I'll turn it over to Julian, who we work quite closely with at Market Forces. Thanks. Um, I guess I just wanted to talk for a few minutes to elaborate more on the role that advocacy groups really play and, and what the end product of that is for everyone working in this space, in this room, from, which is obviously quite a you know, diverse bunch of perspectives, but it always applies. So there's a bunch of things that we sort of outside the, outside the tent often advocacy groups provide that I guess we start doing this work because we want a sustainable planet, we want a livable climate, we want to avoid the horrendous impacts that we know is coming from a runaway climate change situation, and I'm sure so to all of you. But a, a very quick byproduct of a lot of the work we do is that we de-risk the things that you want to be able to invest in and we amplify the risk of the things that we want everybody to get out of. And those are the terms that I really want to talk to you about it on here, because that's, those are the terms that are really relevant. So groups like Market Forces, the group that I run, and um, to an extent, you know, many other groups in the environment sector, play a role to really educate and empower the community where they wouldn't otherwise really have a clue what's going on in the financial sector. And as a result of the work that the environment groups have done, of the advocacy groups have done, you actually have now a, a, a broad public constituency and growing that is not only aware of their connection to industries that completely rub against the grain in terms of their values, absolutely contradict their values, and are given opportunities to do something about that. And that helps in a whole bunch of different ways. You know, we're holding accountable the custodians of other people's money, be they governments or be they super funds, be they banks. We realise and we amplify those risks and costs of fossil fuel investments. We attack the social licence. We're essentially helping to create the conditions in which positive investments become, uh, they become a greater opportunities to make and it being invested in fossil fuels is a lot harder to do. And obviously being on the right side of history in this room, that's to everyone's advantage here. So the results of our work really are we get, we help to deliver some of the policy, some of the practical change from, from investors. Um, the, the fact that we've managed to get all four major banks at least in principle on board with the idea of a, a less than two degree world of global warming we had a lot more to do with that than, than many people would understand and, and appreciate. Um, but advocacy groups have played a huge role in that change. Uh, last year we had $3.6 billion divested from fossil fuels through the superannuation sector. That's divested from fossil fuels. That's not the $21 billion that was passively divested from fossil fuels, i.e. was lost because of 
um, decreasing value of fossil fuel companies. But active decisions by, by funds to divest from three, three and a half billion dollars worth of fossil fuel stocks. Um, as a result, largely the work that community's been doing. We help put distance between fossil fuel projects and their investors. Um, and we pro essentially we provide services as well to people who want to look to divest, to, for institutions who want guidance on, okay, well, what is a fossil fuel free portfolio? The amount of times that we've had calls from uh, advisors uh, saying we want to put together, we've got clients who are asking us to put together fossil fuel free solutions, can you show us your list? Uh, the, n the number of times that we've, we have asked by institutional investors, okay, well, what are the steps? How do we go about doing it? And, you know, uh, we do, I know that you do as well. 350 also provides just steps, one to six. How do you go about fossil fuel investment? Who do you engage with? What does engagement have to mean? What's the result when engagement doesn't get the desired effect? Um, all of which is just pushing in the same direction. So in terms of where we are now, we now have a very aware and engaged and active citizenry that's ready to hold the custodians and their money accountable to how it's used. And that's great for everyone who might work in an institution where they have to push a, uh, have to get a mandate and push that forward internally for change. Anyone who's looking for better conditions in which to invest sustainably, that's all helping all in the same direction. So look, in terms of where, we're here, where we are now, where the focus needs to be, um, I mean, Emma Heard said it before, post Paris, Paris changes everything. Absolutely spot on. Um, and it, it mattered a, a bit of the, towards the outcome, in relation to the outcome of Paris, but really, I think from about six months out from Paris, we were always looking at Paris as that moment where, regardless of how strong the agreement was, we're going to have won, and the momentum's going to be on our side. And the question is now, are the institutions, are the companies actually lined up to be compatible with the two-degree world? Uh, and if they're not, they're going to face a lot of pain. So that's where we are now, and the job now is really just to amplify and, and build that momentum even more because clearly we're facing one of two massive disruptions. Um, we can have a huge economic one or we can have a huge economic one with uh, a habitable planet thrown into the mix as well. So that's the challenge from here. Uh, thanks, Julian. Uh, I'm Richard Dennis from the Australia Institute, uh, Chief Economist. Uh, I usually think power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely, but today I'm actually going to use some slides, which is uh, not usually my thing, but uh, do I need to do anything to make that happen? Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so uh, just by way of background, so the Australian Institute's a think tank. Uh, we're not an advocacy organisation, we're a research organisation. Uh, but a think tank, you know, not very well understood in Australia, which is probably good, helps us. Um, we do research with the view of changing public debate and, more importantly, changing public policy. So our primary task is doing research, but our media strategy and our political strategy isn't an afterthought. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a package deal. And a couple of years ago, uh, Julian and Charlie, and I'm not sure if Blair, um, rang up and said, could the Australia Institute uh, help them out with some divestment stuff? And where's Tom Swan? Uh, good. Uh, so Tom Swan uh, works for the Australia Institute, but uh, was also leading the divestment campaign at ANU. So wonderful little worlds colliding moment. So being a research organisation, the first thing we did was some research, um, which were a couple of papers. Are they the covers of the papers? Yeah, they are. Um, which basically looked at two things. One, if trustees wanted to divest, if your church or your uni wanted to divest, what are the questions you're going to get asked and what would the answers be? Uh, and we put that together to help people do it uh, with the support and encouragement of these guys. Uh, but also the big question, you know, will I go broke if I don't own coal stocks? Uh, was still on people's minds in 2013 and 2014. So one of the bits of research was designed to help trustees and others understand their obligations and the opportunities and help them win fights with their finance committees. Uh, and the other was a bit of evidence about will we go broke. Um, and needless to say, uh, the evidence suggested that you wouldn't go broke. And I'm glad to say, ooh, glad to see um, future supers kind of got a, uh, a, an update of that research out just today, saying that um, you know basically if you sold out of coal before it collapsed, you probably did all right. So, but it's good to see that in numbers. 
So that was the research, that's where we began, but it turned into advocacy quite quickly uh, and it was great fun. Uh, and again, Tom was uh, simultaneously working for us, but as a volunteer uh, driving the ANU divestment uh, campaign, which after the university decided to sell, was it 16? 16 million. Six, yeah, $16 million worth of shares in seven companies. You feel the world tremble, can't you? Like $16 million in shares got sold. Um, I'm not gonna, I've got lots of slides, but it's just the headlines. You've got to notice here, um, ANU under fire over energy giant blacklist. Uh, ANU Santos blacklist a disgrace. Jobs threat, says Abbott Minister. Santos chief tells ANU to withdraw false claims. Cabinet rounds on bizarre ANU. Tony Abbott attacks ANU's stupid decision. This is Tony Abbott calling you stupid. I mean, it'd have to be <laughs> quite a decision, wouldn't it? So we took out a full page ad, first in the Canberra Times and secondly in the Fin Review. Let me just read uh, what the letter said. It was a complete attack from the right. We, the undersigned, support the Australian National University's right to invest in or divest from any companies on environmental, social or ethical grounds. Controversial, huh? People who own shares should be allowed to sell them. We support the role of choice. Radical left-wing stuff, hey? We support the role of choice in the Australian economy and cannot understand why a government that's committed to deregulating the university sector would question the ability of a university to make investment decisions. We were just about to let vice chancellors set fees, but apparently you can't trust them with money. <laughs> it's in every investor's, it is every investor's right to make their own investment decisions without bullying from vested interests and government ministers. Now you can't read the signatures up there, but we've actually got Stephen Hines up there, but also you might remember Malcolm Fraser, bless his heart, uh, he rang up and said, oh, I'd like to sign that, please. A whole bunch of quite conservative political leaders and a whole bunch of the investment community. Is Trevor Thomas in here? F Invest helped us, uh, uh, helped us uh, line up the signatories. But a full-page ad in the Fin Review basically saying, sorry, which, what exactly is the problem? You don't think people who own shares are allowed to sell them, which is, of course, stupid. <laughs> So, uh, and Houston came out, we had all sorts of fun. The Fin Review then put together this little map of intrigue because it wasn't just 350 and us working on this. That's me, the bald one on the left there. Uh, my colleague, Ben Oquist, or an angry looking John Hewson. That's the building we work in. And we work in the same building as Care, who was sitting up the front. So you can just sort of see this incestuous little network, can't you? <laughs> What the Fin Review left off this slide is that I'm a columnist for the Fin Review. Uh, they left out their little role in our little uh, conspiracy. My point is, divestment is political. Um, I'm not surprised that Blair said that the awareness of it here in Australia is higher. It's because we've had a massive overreaction from some precious owners of some pre precious companies, and their overreaction is actually part of the campaign. Like, let's not be shy about it. You know, give an idiot a microphone. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, that does scare some people. The purpose of this campaign, by the way, where are the stats? 53 stories on ANU's divestment, more than Glencore's proposed merger with Rio. Right? This was a bigger story than Glencore and Rio proposing a merger. 12 front pages on the Australian Financial Review. 12 front pages. Criticism from a Prime Minister, a Treasurer and four Ministers. This was designed to scare people. This was, it was a massive overreaction, but the strategic thought behind this was we have to die in a ditch so that no other uni kind of follows ANU. Now, that hasn't quite worked, but it certainly slowed people down. If you were in the session a second ago, the guy from Sydney Uni pretty much conceded as much. So uh, just flipping ahead. Oh, by the way, there's a scale image of the Adani Carmichael mine. That's a scale image. That's what tackling climate change looks like. Um, so, uh, so to wrap up, um, 
the divestment community, uh, people in, interested in divestment for whatever reason, financial, ethical, climate change, uh, I think need to understand both the power uh, and the controversy associated with doing something as simple as selling shares. That's why I put all those slides up, because it's capitalism. You're allowed to sell shares whenever you want. You don't have to explain yourself to anyone. Yet the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, the Education Minister and others have suggested that might not be the case. Happy to talk about why that is, but I don't think it's a surprise that divestment is so salient in the Australian community. The fossil fuels industry has actually made it that way. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, I guess my, what I ask first is um, uh, um, uh, we have a high carbon political economy. I mean, we, it's been. Uh, um, I mean, we started exporting coal, I think, in 1797, and it's deeply uh, entrenched uh, in, in our culture. Uh, Richard, you've been um, leading a lot of challenging of that, the actual, the reality of the power, though. I, mean, I guess it's interesting to impact, um, just to unpack, are we starting to see the cusp of that uh, and the reality finally breaking through that maybe we're not such a high-carbon political economy? Yeah, I mean, in a democracy where we rely on words, not guns, which is a good place to live, um, perception of power is, is power. <laughs> What's the difference between the perceived political power of an organisation and its actual power? And the perceived political power of the mining industry in Australia is huge. And to be honest, the environment movement don't do itself any favours by talking about the big mining industry that's so powerful all the time. It's probably a bit of a mixed message there. So, yeah, look, the Australia Institute since 2009 have kind of banged out more work on this than anything else, but less than 1%, 0.48% of people work in coal mining in Australia. 99% of people don't. But apparently that half a percent is the backbone, <laughs> the backbone on which everyone else's job depends. Because, you know, when coal miners get paid, they, they spend their wages in the local shop. Whereas teachers and nurses, I mean, they just flush it straight down the toilet. There is there are no indirect jobs come from anyone except the mining industry. But this stuff they've got away with literally for decades. In the Walkworth court case, Rio Tinto said the Walkworth extension would create 44,000 new jobs in the Hunter Valley. I grew up in the Hunter Valley. There's only half a million people there. 44,000 jobs. I said in court that I wasn't sure how many, but I thought zero. We won. Because under oath, these claims fall apart. Under oath, the lies that they tell the public, they get away with. And my one-liner is, you know, lying to a journalist is fine, lying to a judge is a crime. You've got to drag them into court because they'll lie everywhere else. So, um, well, because it works. So I guess my point is the, that they're a small employer. They're not, they're not the backbone of anything, but the... You know, to the extent that their power is perceived, their power is real, and you know, you've got to call it out. Yeah, did either of you want to comment on, on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to, to make sure that we uh, just open the conversation broader than the political power. Because one of the great things about how the, the environment movement in Australia is, is it morphs itself. Uh, so well to, to adapt to the circumstances it's dealing with and over the past few years has just broadened its horizons massively while when bringing in shareholder activism, campaigning on financial institutions, banks, institutional investors and actually when where political conditions aren't favourable, well circumvent that. I mean sure there's, there's, we have pretty lax laws in terms of our, our targets and time frames and where we're trying to head with greenhouse gas emissions in Australia, but there's no law saying a bank can't, uh, can't fund the Adani coal mine. There's no law saying that you can't sell out of your stocks. As Richard said, they can kick up an enormous stink about it. Um, but as time tells, that actually turns out to be an incredibly good investment decision. Yeah, and it just feeds the narrative that we actually want to see, which is getting out of this industry is not just good for the planet, but um, good for your finances as well. Um, you can have all of that conversation without mentioning a single government minister. So we can attack power and change power from a whole bunch of different perspectives. And I think the movement here is really well placed to do that. That's why I'm really optimistic about the scale of change we can deliver over the next few years. Uh, I just add, uh, we have a website for pollution-free politics, so it's worth looking at how much money goes from 
the fossil fuel industry directly into the political parties, the revolving door of employees that go from the mining in industry into political senior positions within uh, ministers' offices is appalling. It is absolutely appalling. Uh, if there's any question as to why we don't have policy on climate change that's effective and minimizing the, the impact in Australia, uh, I'd say look to that. But of the 30-plus people on our dirty 30 list of climate blockers, elected officials, three are down. We've got 27 to go before the election. Okay. Uh, throw it up to questions. Uh, Leora. Uh, Leora Black, Australian Centre for Corporate Social Responsibility. Can you hear me? Yes. Sure. Yeah. And th look, thanks for a really interesting panel discussion. I really enjoyed all three presentations. I've got a question about um, activist activist tactics or NGO tactics for the future on the question of um, divestment. We've seen really effective array of tactics by activists in the past against things like the Mount uh, uh, Wally. Uh, Mount uh, Walkworth, Thorley Walkworth, whatever uh, extension. Um, uh, we've seen um, NGOs sort of uh, creating coalitions to sue mines and so forth, and with quite uh, quite effective uh, tactics to delay, um, if not stop altogether, these projects. Um, is this going to be a set of tactics that you would consider in the future? So, for example, will we see market forces suing a bank for not decarbonising um, fast enough? So, will things go to that level? I had my computer stolen last week and it had some of my plans on it and now I think I know where they went. <laughs> <laughs> if it's the right tactic that will get the right change from the right institution, yeah. Um, you know, I, as far as we're concerned, as, as long as it's you know, a, uh, a tactic that's not going to put people in, you know, direct harm's way or, or, you know, create a violent situation, then if it's the right tactic to get to get the right shift out of an institution or a company or whatever it might be, then, then sure. And we're certainly looking at the moment, now that the conditions are changing from a, I guess, a policy and a regulatory framework more into our favour, then that creates more legal opportunities as well. Um, to hold institutions that have made statements around climate policy accountable to that, to those statements, but also the conditions in which coal companies can and have to operate. So we just have more and more recourse legally. And I think some of the incredible work that's been done over the past few years to, I, I guess, build up a bit more of the legitimate moral high ground in calling out the industry on, let's face it, just the lies and bullshit that they've used to try and peddle their project expansions or all the, you know, as Richard gave examples in the Hunter Valley, also up in, in the Galilee Basin, how that's going to create apparently, what, 10,000 jobs? No, 4,000 jobs, no. What was the line this morning? Oh, let's not quibble over jobs as soon as the truth comes out. Um, not letting companies get away with that nonsense anymore. So uh, probably one of the areas that you'll see a lot more work done is actually using the legal opportunities that create, get created as the policy and regulatory conditions change in our favour. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, thanks, Jill. In it, I've just uh, written a book called A Connor Babble on how to call that kind of bullshit out. Um, but look, a, a tactic that we're working on at the moment, it's a bit odd, but I think we've got to think big, is uh, a global moratorium on new coal mines. Now, a lot of people go, oh, that'll never happen. Australia won't sign up. It's like, well, you're missing the point, kids. Um, Japan doesn't support a moratorium on whaling. But the rest of the world does, and it's placed enormous, excruciating foreign policy pressure uh, on Japan. So, uh, yeah, I think we need to think big. Um, similarly, I think we need to look at, from a finance point of view, um, uh, a moratorium on coal basically kills off the long run for coal industry, which is a short seller's dream. So there's plenty of options. Anyone know a short seller out there? Um, you know, apart from short selling coal because it's a good idea in general, drive policy that actually kills it off quicker and you'll make your money faster. So there's plenty of tactics around. Anyone pull together hedge fund? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's really important to note um, how much this is coming up on the radar of the investors and the financial authorities and regulators as well. And so, you know, it, um, the Exxon new case is obviously uh, making headlines, but um, Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, talked about the liability risks. It's actually there in the Bloomberg task um, 
force report as, um, as one of the non-physical climate risks that uh, companies now need to start to disclose. So these exposures are important and it's important that there are people um, such as these and the Australian Centre for Corporate Responsibility starting to talk, uh, um, talk about those initiatives as well. Other question? I was just wondering if there's an opportunity in the, um, in the advocacy agenda to put more emphasis on invest rather than divest because it's a more positive thing and it gives um, you know, the mainstream a bit more hope for the future. Yeah, I think it's been one of our biggest challenges, especially in Australia, because the information is much more limited than it is in the global market. So pointing people, you know, hand on heart to, hey, here's a great place you can move into, like, you know, really feeling uncomfortable that there isn't enough information out there or that you would want to be promoting things that you just don't know enough about. So I think um, I hope that in the next couple of years there's a lot more focus on um, investors and and people like Bloomberg providing more information to people to give them opportunities. Um, that's been bigger in the US and a little bit globally, but a real struggle in Australia, but I hope so. Yeah, I to totally agreed. I mean, I feel like some of the gains we've made on renewable energy and, and finance becoming available for renewable energy has been a, a in, to an extent, not a huge extent, but to some extent a, a byproduct of the work that we've done, that it's kind of been a little bit of a pressure valve um, that's been released by some of the institutions we've worked on, the extent to which we've managed to expand the scope for renewable energy, but then there's the opportunities created to, to deploy that, and, and we want to see a lot of that deployed here in Australia. So one of the big challenges we have now, I guess another extension of that where to from here question, is how do we get beyond this Mexican standoff taking place in the Australian power sector where you have everyone who's really bleeding now because we've got, you know, uh, greater efficiency and high renewables, meaning the lower wholesale cost of electricity, people making less money, no one's ready to wave the white flag yet, do we need to offer someone a golden handshake, do we keep squeezing them with renewables, but really we just need to find that trigger that's going to actually get coal off the grid uh, and just clear out more space for renewables to fill that gap. Yeah, I strongly endorse that, I mean, we've gotten some work coming, it's just that, I mean, uh, we're not going to have. We're going to innovate around the edges <clears throat> until we actually have a, a transition plan for the uh, to modernise our energy system. That's really important. And the second thing in terms of that is obviously this is what today is about is actually helping um, the various sectors engage and provide opportunities and link people up. So uh, a couple of things there. Richard, did you want to add something? Oh, just to add. Um, <laughs> well, let's let's not forget that we do have some of those opportunities. I mean, future super ethical investment. They're, these are rapidly growing companies, small but rapidly growing, the significance there is that A, getting institutions to divest, good, well, you know, what about default super, defaulting into the ethical version, what can organisations do on that space? But secondly, you know, to be clear, the reason that Australia are deferential to the mining industry is they're rich, wouldn't it be nice to grow some big, rich, ethical investment <laughs> houses that we can then be deferential towards? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Thomas Schroeder, South Pole Group. Uh, I have a question that picks up on what you just said, and this is really, um, so I'm a big supporter of everything that you do, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing Bill McKibben speak at the end of the month here. This will all be really great. Um, I just wonder, how can you make what you do more mainstream, really? Because uh, I still feel this is really more for the enlightened people, and even if you look at politics, it's really just a sad scene, uh, uh, watching what politicians say and all that. So do you have any link to... Uh, like a more positive uh, political party or how, how can you like what's your strategy of making this more mainstream well you know I guess one of the reasons we for instance target super fund, large super funds mainstream super funds is that uh, you know by switching one major super fund you are in the mainstream in Australia and it's not an insignificant amount of money so that's been one of the reasons that Isaac who's here with us 350 works you know specifically looking at making the case if you want to start with a small fossil free subset fund great but even better if you could put a screen on the whole of the fund and then explain to people why you're doing it fiduciary duty climate environment looking ahead and hey it's looking like it's making good money sense too those are educational ways to get to the mainstream because people, you know, have a super fund in Australia. Everybody has one. So that's one way to try to mainstream it through the churches is another way. We've tried to work with uh, religious institutions and a range of churches because they speak to a different audience and they're often bringing an ethical overlay. 
Uh, so it's another way. It's a challenge, though. And, you know, the Greens are great, but like you say, they're speaking to a smaller percentage of people. But interesting scenarios where they are looking more interested in the, the um, interests of farmers, maybe, than the National Party, uh, which used to be the number one, you know, party representing agriculture in Australia, not taking up concerns about coal seam gas. So you can see a vote swing oddly all the way around to the Greens in, say, northern New South Wales. An interesting example of, like, not representing your, uh, your, you know, your base, your core, uh, and not hearing their concerns about fossil fuels from their perspective. Uh, so looking at all those avenues, I think, is probably the best way we've tried to expand out. Um, look, just quickly, the, there are more reasons to divest than climate change, and uh, Tony Abbott broke the Australian public debate about climate change, but deeply conservative commentators like Alan Jones of Shock Jock Radio Guys obsessed. He ha he, he's a climate sceptic who hates coal mining. So the thing is, divestment is actually more mainstream, bizarrely. Divestment is more mainstream than tackling climate change. So be, be careful not to conflate the two. There are plenty of farmers who hate coal mines mm. and hate coal seam gas and hate the mining companies who are climate sceptics. I, I also want to add, um, for us, we see this as part of a big, profound um, shift as well. I mean, this is a, we talk, I talk about the rise of the civil economy. Um, and in our Climate Smart Super, we actually can look at the rise of the civil society, which happened that took centuries, you know, rule of law, separation of powers, monitoring agencies, both in public and in, in, in private, and the roles of NGOs and monitoring. So a, a similar architecture is emerging, and I think it's really important to, um, to think about how we're doing that in that bigger picture to actually really... So this is a, a, a new normalisation. We're getting the Australian Institute of Company directors saying you need to align long-term interests better than the, the focus on the short-term interests. I've still got to look at this submission today, but the Financial Services Council arguing for mandatory climate disclosure um, is a pretty big deal, I think. I, don't, I want to look at this, the fine print, though. Um, MMA may have had a chance to look at that on that today. But, so I think it's, there's a big... Uh, it's quite a profound shift that's happening uh, here as well in the bigger picture, I think, we should look at. Just, just one last thing to add is that it... It, to, to some extent, it may already be mainstream. Yeah. There was a survey earlier this year that um, <laughs> referred to, I think, 50% of asset managers contemplating fossil fuel divestment. The, the thing is that it, how often do we hear about that? It's through that occasional story of a survey. And, and, and this is really the sort of thing we're trying to encourage and engender is a more active conversation about why. You know, we, we get people to line up in front of banks and close their bank accounts wearing T-shirts saying, I've just left my bank because they fund fossil fuels. Now, they might be taking a few hundred thousand dollars collectively out of the bank on that, at that branch on that day, but what's, what's the value in, in the activity? It's the fact that all of those photos are going on social media. The news is coming down to cover it. And so if anyone here is contemplating the divestment, because frankly, you're a very important group, because you're really at the leading edge of this. And so as you're contemplating divestment, think about the actual value that it can create, far broader than the, the, the impact on your portfolios or whatever you happen to manage. It's the social value that, that really is going to drive along this, um, this public discussion. Because you're right, this, this is a really awesome, special meeting, a special event, and it shouldn't be. It should, this should be run of the mill. And so be vocal, because we can get to that point a lot quicker. We'll pack out the Star Casino next year, don't worry. <laughs> Hi, Peter Sainsbury. Um, so I'm here because my wife and I have a small foundation um, but we uh, and a self-managed super fund that's fossil free but we feed that super fund and the foundation because we both work in health and I just wanted to bring in the broader perspective about mainstreaming and about health and it's good you mentioned Isaac a moment ago because uh, a group has been working with Isaac I don't know really for 15 months or so um, on trying to sort of get health uh, agencies more divested, involved in divestment. I mean, just to make a couple of points. First is that the health implications of climate change are absolutely immense and, and not as widely recognised as they should be, and uh, the health organisations bear some responsibility for that. The second is that the health sector has an immense uh, carbon footprint on its own, probably something like 5% of total um, national emissions come from the health sector. 
But the third is, of course, that um, it's an immensely emotive issue and one that can, uh, can motivate individuals and groups. And so the RACP, the Royal Australian College of Physicians, divested last year, announced that it was going to divest and has been doing. Um, and so it was with groups like Isaac that we were trying to encourage others. The AMA have been a bit slower on one thing or another. Um, but just to say it along those lines, uh, two groups, uh, Doctors for Environment Australia and the Climate and Health Alliance, will be releasing a report um, in a month's time about uh, health and divestment and, and fundamentally trying to get uh, individual health professionals but also um, not so much hospitals because they're government, well, certainly public hospitals anyway, um, but research institutions and so on who may well have money invested in, um, in fossil fuel industries and, and super funds. Um, that I think there is an immense opportunity for advocacy through other sectors like the health sector. I've, I think, as Tony Jones will say, I'll take that as a comment, which we're all furiously... Um, uh, 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 not, nodding away, and that gives me a time to uh, wrap it up. Um, can you please join me in thanking the uh, panel? For